begins, but our first speaker is going to be uh, Yumiko. And um, Yumiko, as I said, is currently based in Addis Ababa, where she works as the director of UNESCO IICBA, which is the International Institute for Capacity Building in Africa. She's got many years experience um, in education and NGOs in several Af African countries, and um, including working for UNICEF and JICA. And she's going to share, oh, I'm great. I'm so glad this is working because I was very nervous about that. So do you want to um, share the video, Yumiko? Is this? Or yes. Right? Yes, I think I will share it from here. If it gets stuck, though, would you like to take over? But yeah, it, so looks, far, it looks it, fine. It, looks it, it seems to be working. Okay, so thank you. So I'm going to hand over to you and you have about 20 minutes and then we'll open up for discussion questions from the audience. Okay, thank you very much, Judith. Um, my name is Yumiko. I'm, uh, I'm working for a UNESCO ICBA, International Institute for Capacity Building in Africa, based in Addis Ababa. Um, this organization, uh, this institute works for uh, teacher development in the whole of African continent. So my presentation today is really through the teacher's eyes in Africa on the child poverty, especially current situation affected by COVID-19. Very quickly about ICBA. Um, ICBA was established 20 years ago and uh, working on teacher policy and teacher development in Africa with uh, SDG, uh, Education 2030, African Union and African Union's Continental Education Strategies for Africa. Improving quality of education through teacher development in Africa is uh, something, oh dear, I'm sorry, I, uh, just uh, I'll go very quickly. So we work on the capacity development, uh, partnership and advocacy and the research and development. And for capacity development, we act on the catalyst taking on a facilitative, facilitative role and recognize capacity development as a long-term process. Our motto is African solutions for African challenges. So we do a lot of um, um, sharing of um, uh, examples from um, countries to uh, countries, uh, other countries which have similar challenges and similar situations. And uh, we look at uh, teachers level, institutional level and policy level. And uh, we look at the science uh, and STEM and uh, emergency and post-conflict and education for sustainable development, learning assessment and the language of instruction. Now, since last year, uh, March, we have been uh, supporting uh, teachers in Africa and the majority of countries close the schools so over one year. So during the school closure, distance learning took place, but not the, all the schools and all the children were reached and the school's reopening was also a major challenge. We have been running a weekly webinars, uh, targeting on teachers. And then also we um, have a virtual campus and online courses. From the past experience, we realized that the many opportunities are available instead of just a teaching in classrooms a lot of resources are available and uh, some schools and some teachers made a very good use of these resources but internet connectivity was a major challenge for uh, many countries especially in rural and uh, uh, peri-urban areas so it was a very um, difficult journey now, uh, what we came to know is child poverty is evident in many African countries, I mean, many countries in the region with a diversity both between countries and, and within these countries. So sometimes the difference between the cities and the rural areas was much bigger than um, differences between the industrialized countries and uh, developing countries in the region. And the COVID-19 pandemic crystallized the existing child poverty issues in Africa. Haves and have nots became very, very clear. And the gap is widening, gap has been widening. And we are more aware of the issues. 
And yet there are many solutions I will go, uh, go into later, but they haven't been implemented. So it has been very, very frustrating. The pandemic widened the gap between the industrialized countries and the developing nations with education sectors resilience and education infrastructures difference and including the internet connectivity. Now, um, resources are available, readily available in, uh, in the web, but just like now that I cannot use that video in this, our connectivity in many countries are limited. And as I speak now in Addis Ababa, the, uh, the Tigray region in the north does not have an internet at all. So they cannot, and they even because of the current situation, the gathering of, of more than four people is not allowed. So schools are not open. So the, it is not only COVID-19, but the um, political and uh, and the security situations matter very much. And also school closure took some of the basic welfare measures from the children. One of the things is the school meals, but also clean water and the toilet facilities and the health education, as well as uh, sanitary pads were uh, distributed to girls in many schools, but it's not done. It wasn't done during the school closure and also psychosocial support and the peer learning were um, very various things that uh, we lost. So what are the fundamental issues? Again, I hesitate to say this because the African continent is diverse and the 54 countries have a, um, each a very uh, different uh, situation. So if my simplistic argument offends uh, people, I apologize now. But um, learning crisis and learning poverty, they exist in many countries. Learning achievement is relatively low. Um, there was, um, um, before the election, there was a, a sensational um, national crisis in Uganda that after six years of um, formal learning, many children could not even construct a sentence. And uh, similar stories are, are there in many countries. And uh, strong, and unfortunately, even within the countries, strong correlation to income levels that the 20%, 20 percentile of economic, um, economic what, uh, top 20% children from these families do much better than the bottom 20%. And again, if you look at the, what kind of schools they go, the top 50, uh, top 20, 40% of the income bracket, they go to um, fee paying private schools where um, schools have a better facilities and also schools, um, there is a better time on task. So the um, inequity did exist before uh, COVID-19 crisis, but the COVID crisis pandemic widened this gap because those children who are in uh, government schools, not very well resourced, did not have uh, much learning during the last year. So learning was made more difficult due to the Medium uh, and then uh, learning is in general made more difficult due to the medi medium of instruction. Many children, especially in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, have to learn in their second or third languages from the grade one, and that has um, profound um, impact on their learning. And the school closure further widened this gap. And the governance and the political and the social stability of a nation is very critical, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, currently in, uh, in, in the northern Ethiopia, there is a, a crisis, of course, crisis in, in learning, but um, uh, even more severe crisis does uh, exist. And we are wondering how many years it will take to bring the situation back to normal. And during the um, school closure, domestic violence and 
um, gender-based violence increased. And uh, unfortunately, the uh, victims are most of the times uh, young women. And armed the conflicts and in, uh, increased and then the vulnerability of the children. And um, I think you you might have heard of uh, school uh, school attacks and the abduction of a uh, um, young uh, student, young uh, female students from Nigeria. This time they were uh, returned within days, but um, school attacks do take place in many countries, especially in the Sahel region, and uh, this is also um, something which has um, been affecting. Uh, affecting the schools and the children. And uh, resilience and education system and the, of, and the children. Now, um, we realize that the education system uh, are very weak and vulnerable, and then that has, has to increase its resilience. So disaster risk reduction, capacity to deal with a natural and man-made emergency, and also safe school guidance and measures are needed. And the role of teachers and the school leadership are very, very important, but it is not done. Uh, one, example that, uh, one of the examples that during the school closure, many teachers were not paid. So they were, when they're not paid, it's very difficult for them to even get the internet connection to start distance learning, e-learning. And the need for a better internet access for teachers and children is one of the lessons learned. We um, discussed with uh, many countries, uh, telecom companies, if they could provide a free internet access for education purposes, but uh, it wasn't, it, uh, the offer wasn't forthcoming, unfortunately. On the other hand, many children in the continent are resilient and creative. They have survived the situations. They couldn't go to schools. They have um, avoided the domestic violence. They um, survived the situations. And uh, this le lead me to lead us to think, and it was mentioned during the uh, introduction, the voices of children, especially the voices of young women and girls must be reflected in school management and education policy. We must build on the existing resilience and then we must listen to the um, uh, children and, and uh, or teachers on that matter because often teachers can amplify uh, and the children's voices and uh, and what children want to say in a more acute, articulate manner. So it is very important for us to have a teacher's voices as children's voices. Um, UNESCO ICBA works mainly with our teachers and teacher educators as well as um, policy makers. So the voices we hear most are from the teachers. And during the pandemic, we heard almost a scream from the uh, teachers. Teachers' voices were not heard during the pandemic. They stopped the schools immediately uh, and abruptly in many countries. Teachers were not aware that the schools would close the next day. So many teachers paid, um, took their own money to photocopy some of the vital uh, learning materials and then gave them to the children. I know some teachers who lost all her, her credit, uh, telephone credit, because she was um, texting children their homework. So at least if they were told beforehand to prepare, or if they were given some additional resources to um, be prepared for the e-learning and so on. And the, the situation would have been much better. And uh, I would like to, during the pandemic, I, we were all some, somehow disappointed, sometimes disappointed by, the lack of actions from policymakers and also some of the teachers who completely withdrew from their work. But at the same time, 
um, we were impressed and more often by teachers who did the heroic works on bringing uh, learning to um, schools. And now schools are reopening and uh, they are doing their best. But of course, physical distancing is not really possible in many situations, especially in big cities where the classrooms are already crowded. For, uh, for example, in Addis Ababa, it is not uncommon for um, grade one class has 80 children. So what they are doing is to have a morning and afternoon shift. It solves some of the problems, but brings another problem that the time on task is extremely limited. However, at this moment, we have been working along with the teachers and we would like to um, ask teachers to their best so that they are returning to school for our teachers and the schools would somehow become a much happier and uh, hopeful situations. That's all from me. Thank you very much. Over to 